Welcome to A House Divided. I'm Daniel Weinberg at, in the broadcast studio of Abraham Lincoln Bookshop here in Chicago. Uh, we're, of course, an antiquarian shop that specializes in Lincoln, the Civil War, and U.S. presidency. Uh, we carry all sorts of historical artifacts, original books, autographs, photography, statuary prints, and much more. Check us out at alincolnbookshop.com. And of course, you may purchase signed books of, uh, of our author from today. Here is the book, and I'll introduce her in a moment. But this is the book that we're going to be talking about, Benjamin uh, Franklin Butler. And since this is day of release, we have our special book plates that say it's the day of release. So this is almost like a limited edition for you. If you order it today, you'll get one of these. If it's ordered later, you will get a signed book plate nonetheless. So without further ado, I'm happy to introduce uh, our author today who's, who was here a decade ago, uh, I think, uh, Elizabeth Leonard. She got her PhD from the University of California, Riverside. And she is today the John J. and Cornelia V. Gibson Professor of History at Colby College, specializing in American women in the Civil War era. Her books include Yankee Women, All the Daring of the Soldier, Women of the Civil War Armies, Men of, Men of Color to Arms, Lincoln's Avengers, Black Soldiers, Indian Wars, and the Quest for Equality. Her last book, Lincoln's Forgotten Ally, I think it's the last book, Lincoln's Forgotten Ally, Judge Advocate General Joseph Holt of Kentucky, uh, co-won the prestigious Gilder Lehrman Lincoln Prize back in 2011. That was a wonderful book. So her latest book is uh, Benjamin Franklin Butler, A Noisy, Fearless Life, the University of North Carolina Press publication. It's 356 pages illustrated and is $36 and well worth every penny of that. Now, frankly, I didn't know that I'd be entering such an interesting biography of a man who has come down in history as the beast, stormy petrol, spoons, and more. I can't think of a Civil War general that had more nicknames than <laughs> Ben Butler, for heaven's sakes. And yes, by the way, there are, we found out today, Butler collectors. He sent a couple of things here is one little piece that he sent in for us. This doll looks like it can be wound up. That would be interesting, a wound up butler. And also this side view, a plaster it looks like to me. I'll have to find out more about it. So there are people who actually collect butler. News to me. So butler lived from 1818 to 1893. He was a lawyer, Civil War general, congressman, governor, and also at age 13, worked in a bookshop. So I feel he was one of my colleagues. Was he a bookish person? Extremely Elizabeth? bookish. Did he collect? Yeah. Did he read a great deal? He loved to read. I don't know later in his life when he was so busy, how much time he had to sit around reading by the fire, but he it was his um, intellectual pursuits and his desire to read and learn that you know pushed him forward. Uh, I'd love for you to explain the subtitle, A Noisy Fearless Life. How Happy is he noisy and in what <laughs> manner? Well, first of all, let me thank you uh, and Bjorn for having me at the bookshop again. It's such a pleasure to be with you. And I just want to correct one piece of the introduction, which is that I am an emerita professor now. I am retired from Colby. So I am no longer oh, in the department, know. but I have I live just down the street. So I'm almost still there. Well, um, they're lost, but then you're <laughs> welcome to history to do more in history. That's right. right so the noisy, fearless life um, subtitle comes from a an essay by my predecessor at Colby, a wonderful scholar named Harold Raymond, who wrote in 1964, a reassessment of Butler, just an essay for the Colby Quarterly, which was our literary magazine at the time. And he was referring to Butler's relentless 
persistence and fearless fearlessness around speaking his mind and saying what he had to say. And he described him as a noisy, fearless advocate in that essay. And the book itself is actually dedicated to Harold Raymond, even though he is no longer with us. Um, but I wanted to uh, recognize, I thought the phrase was excellent, a wonderful descriptive phrase yes. for Mr. Butler. And I also wanted to honor uh, Harold Raymond. So I uh, used that as the subtitle. Um, it's, I love the dust jacket, by the oh, way. Oh, me too. The, the image. You went, but, she's amazing. You know, it's the first time impressed. I've ever seen him with a beard. I have not remember seeing this before. And uh, of course, he's not known with that. So how is this chosen since it is so unique? How is that chosen uh, as the dust jacket image? Well, ironically, the, the image does appear in the book as well in black yes. and white. But when we were discussing the um, what to use for the cover, UNC Press designers asked me if I had any specifications. And I said, I only ask you to please use a picture that does not feed into his lifelong and posthumous, the mockery he endured throughout his life and posthumously because of his droopy eyes, uh, his this natural problem that he had with his vision and the droopiness of his eyelids and he was short and stout. And he was a very, um, much mocked uh, individual in imagery as well as in other ways. And I am, I was trying very hard to step back from that way of treating him. And they chose this picture. And when I first saw the cover, I said, that's the perfect picture because everyone mm, will nice. say exactly what you just said. I've never seen him this way. And exactly. I think the book is the same thing. People who think they know Butler and read this book will decide wow, I've never seen him that way. Well, I think that's the point of this and what I was saying near the beginning that yeah. uh, we, I've not seen Butler in this fashion. Everyone has talked about him, historians and the way we all know him to be, allegedly. And you've right. shown a, a totally different part of him that uh, I don't know if I love the man any more than maybe some of his contemporaries did, but I respect him more uh, and I think you'll, anyone reading this, they should, because this will turn over a page in historiography, I think, this book. So and I want to ask you about this without going into huge length again, because we have a lot to, to discover in this book. But in your preface, you write about why this book matters. And maybe we just answered that question, but just quickly say a couple of words by inference, that's because Butler still matters to readers today. Explain that, please. I think that it's always good to capture a better uh, and more accurate picture of important historical figures. And I think no reader can come away from this book thinking he wasn't an important historical figure. So I think he matters. But he also matters to us in our world today. So he matters in his own right, to be understood the way he should be understood. And I also think he's a figure we can learn from today in terms of his having, especially through the period after the war, but also during the war, also before the war, but especially in reconstruction, the kinds of things he concerned himself with, the problems that we still face today. And I think that um, it matters to have these people in our past we can turn to for wisdom, guidance, understanding, um, hope, <laughs> you know, and, and he was in many ways, an, it, it's great to have heroes who uh, are, you know, bigger than life and, and, and so on. It's also great to know that ordinary people mm -hmm. can make dramatic changes and dramatic impacts on the world. And he started and out as a pretty ordinary person. And changes within himself as well. Yeah, we, and we he get could to grow. some of that as well. Yes, he uh, could grow. You know, you're you uh, are living. You 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 were a professor. You were a professor at Colby, which started out as Waterville College, 
uh, until the generous donor came about in 1864. And <laughs> but let's point out $50,000 was all it took to save the college at the time, which I think well, is pretty great. <laughs> that's, that's a lot of money, uh, nonetheless, at that time. And again, he saved yeah. it and they changed it. No different really than Washburn College in Kansas that came was dedicated as Lincoln College during his lifetime. And Washburn came, came up with money to save it and they changed from Lincoln to Washburn. Humbling to me here at the Abraham Lincoln Bookshop. Yes. And I might say a sad note that 11 days ago, the other college named after Lincoln during his lifetime, same time as Washburn, Lincoln College in Lincoln, Illinois, which Abraham had earlier surveyed, just went down and it would take more than 50,000. They were talking about 50 million to save it and they didn't have it. So I was on the board there for a little over a decade and uh, it's going to be missed if not at all. Uh, what part of your being a professor at Colby with Butler's correspondence there uh, made you go and write this book? Well, in, I had been um, encouraged by people in our special collections department um, to consider, you know, especially after the Holt biography, to consider doing something about Butler, this very important figure at the college, uh, for people who were in special collections, knowing we had this collection. He was not so well loved or touted by the college at large or even by its most of its alumni but i so i was always sort of he was there i was there should we get together and talk you know dead butler and me should we should we uh come to some kind of understanding but it was really some years ago when gary gallagher and i were talking and i said to gary it's so hard to be at colby when at bowden they have joshua chamberlain and all we have is Ben Butler, you know, and Bowden makes so much out of Joshua Chamberlain, so dashing and little round top and, you know, I mean, and he was so upstanding and et cetera. And I didn't know enough about Butler yet. So I thought, and we've got, you know, the, the beast. And it was Gary who said, think again, Colby has every right to be proud of him. And uh, here are some reasons why. And it, it pushed me to look deeper and it made sense since I was right there, you know. Of course, Chamberlain was a good marketeer of himself. I think yes. uh, we could yeah. say that as well. Yeah. Uh, one of the reasons he is in the forefront of Gettysburg people, partly because of himself. Of course, Elijah right. Lovejoy was at Waterville. Uh, there's another one, though, you can at least write a few essays about, perhaps, now that you're, yes. you're retired. Uh, did, did Waterville mean anything to Butler? Waterville, the town, the college. or the college, um, it meant, I mean, it, he didn't really want to go there. He wanted to go to West Point. He was sort of annoyed that he got stuck at Waterville College, which was where his mother wanted him to go. Um, I think he made good friends there. I think he found it a very frustrating and, and restrictive place in terms of its religious orientation. Mm -hmm. uh, and he didn't really buy that. He used to say, you know, I never want to go to chapel. Can I just pay all my fines up front so I don't have to ever, <laughs> you don't have to keep fining me. I'll just pay them all up front and not go to chapel. Um, but he made good friends. He, he made connections. Uh, and he also, you know, had the fun of a young college student um, and got into some trouble and um, so on. I think he was a little annoyed going back to your comment about um, Mr. Colby, Gardner Colby saving the college. Um, there is some evidence that Butler later in his life was a little annoyed the college wasn't renamed after him, but he didn't he didn't bring the money, so. Yeah, right. And that counts in, uh, in that college that university. Sure. Uh, yeah. I was going to get to this a little bit later. And again, I want kind of do this in an elevator Sort of, sort of view real quickly. Uh, I showed you before you we went on this letter that uh, is not in the hand of Butler, but he right. signed it with, and I know that signature very, very well, his handwriting. Uh, and this is in December uh, of 1863 to a Reverend blog. And I just want to uh, quickly say what, what he's saying in here. 
yours of the 15th received, if conscientiously scrupulous of taking any oath you can affirm, using that word when the word swear is used, and omitting the words, so help me God. So he was saying that you could use a word affirm and not swear. I was kind of surprised to see that a man of the cloth may not want to say, uh, so help me God, but nonetheless. So I was going to ask what Butler's religious views were, but I think you've just mentioned that. He didn't go very far and he didn't really carry religion through his life, is that correct? I think he would have said that he was a, a Christian. I think he would have said that, but I've never seen him you know, emote about being a religious man. His mother was deeply religious. He certainly, as long as she would have, was alive, would not have, you know, he was very devoted to her and he would never have contradicted her. But I, he found things like pre, the notion of predestination just ridiculous. He said, well, you know, why would anybody do anything good if everything's all sorted out in advance? You know, what's the point? So I don't, it certainly wasn't a driving force in his right. life, let's put it that way. I and he didn't want to be a minister. I'm sorry, again? He did not want to be a minister, which is what exactly. his mother hoped he would grow up to be. Exactly. Was she very disappointed when he didn't do that? I, I think that she made a peace with it, but th that's yeah. why she sent him to Waterville College. She hoped, you know, she, he wanted to go to West Point. She sent him to Waterville. She didn't get no. what she wanted, but she no. was very, below. she loved him too. I mean, they were very close, so. That was my father sending, wanting me to go to Washington University in pre-med, which I did for a couple of years and then went out screaming. It wasn't for me. And I, I think he finally became peace with it, especially when I came to the shop. I want to talk some brief uh, thoughts of, of Butler's character. Uh, first of all, what were your impressions, like all of us, or you had more going into the book? And did they really change? at the end through your research? Well, I think that like everybody else who knows anything about him pretty much, you know, I expected him to be full of ego and ambition and perhaps rather wily and maybe incompetent in some ways. I mean, I, I sort of had absorbed all of this lore about him and you know, to put it simply, in getting to know him over many years, <laughs> I became much more, as you said, respectful of him, impressed by him. Um, I love his his mind. I love his humor. I think he's um, he was he was all the in some ways, all the things that people who criticized him said, but he was also all the opposite things too. And um, he's a fascinating, complicated figure at, and deeply, deeply interesting. Positively, uh, I'm a foot, uh, footnote reader and I could have done this entire questionnaire today from your footnotes. <laughs> There's so much in there. And to read some of the things you couldn't put into the main part of the book, some of the his writings, what he said about this or about that, oh. fascinating. In fact, uh, but here's one you put in because he was a, as you point out, a blunt speaker. And here is just one uh, short paragraph that I found that I thought I'd read for our viewers. Um, the people in the South remember that I carried on war against them when they were my enemies and the enemies of my country. When I am called upon to make war, I kill, slay, and destroy my enemies in every way I can. I am sorry I did not do a better and more of it because I would have brought the war sooner to a close and saved great many valuable lives on both sides. That's blunt talk, post-war. Yes. But then he goes on to say, therefore, white Southerners, he means, but he says, Southerners should know, and this is long after the war, that if I am with them, I am with them. If I would be against them, I will be against them. If I say I'm with them, I am with them. And better to have me as a friend and be truly a friend than someone who says they're your friend and is not really your friend. 
Yeah. What was he like as a public speaker? Uh, he was, a, even people who didn't like him said he was an excellent public speaker. He was very um, skilled in, in terms of his persuasiveness, his use of language, his emotion. Uh, he, I think, spoke very frankly and bluntly, to use your term. Uh, he was a very skilled public speaker. I'm thinking right now of Lincoln and Cooper Union. Uh, they were appalled when he stepped up on the stage. Yeah. This is the best Illinois can do. And right. then he opened his mouth. Right. And they right. were in rapture. Yeah. Butler, too, did, he must have felt something about his appearance. You've alluded to that. Uh, and people must have seen him and said, oh, my God, what is that? Until he opened his mouth, same thing? I think that's probably quite true. I think his, his, his great or oratorical skill probably very quickly made people forget what he looked like, you know, or well, it, you know, people then remembered, of course, but, but I think that he also was very much at peace with how he looked. I don't, I don't, I didn't find anything in the, the research that I did that suggested he felt, you know, that this was a burden for him. He, you know, he was like, well, this is what I look like. And later in his life, he had surgery to fix his eye, his eyelid, one of his eyelids. And people were like, do you want us to take, make new drawings of you? And his daughter's like, are you going to be, you know, is this going to change the way you look? And he said, ah, everybody knows how I look. You know, it doesn't, doesn't matter to me anymore. You know, it's, it's fine. This is how I look. And there's no point in, you know, pretending I look any other way. He just had other skills and appearance, you know, wasn't, and frankly, he doesn't look so bad here, you know? No, that's why I think I love that, especially. <laughs> Although I will say his daughter, Blanche, hated the beard. Well, I'm glad she isn't in the Abraham Lincoln bookshop today. Um, <laughs> uh, you alluded to his humor. Can you give me an example? Give our viewers an example of, oh, of his humor? An example of his humor. Well, I mean, the way that he was very self-effacing about his appearance was certainly one example. And the way that he would almost never rise to the occasion of somebody, you know, a, a random person criticizing him. He let a lot of things go, but every once in a while he would slap back at them and say, you know, you only think that I, for example, stole spoons be, uh, from New Orleans because that's what you would do. And I would never do it. What does he say? The mole never thinks, thinks the whole world is dark because that's uh, the world the mole lives in. The uh, mole can't imagine the beauty of another, you know, of the sunlight. Um, just very clever and very, very funny. He was very witty then as well. And he, and he was very witty with his, um, his grandchildren. I mean, and with little kids, he really loved his grand, grandchildren. There's a lot of sweet... Um, um, evidence of that in the book about his relationship with his grandchildren. There's a lot about the family in your book uh, mm -hmm. interspersed throughout. They, they keep coming in because they seem to have been a part of his life uh, entirely. Uh, and especially his wife, Sarah, uh, whose relationship, well, what was that relationship like? He certainly, she, what I'm trying to say, did, did she have a uh, impact on his career at all. Uh, he, she certainly felt many times that poli other generals, politicians were against him uh, because yeah. they didn't want him to be, because he was so great that they right. didn't want him to eclipse them. That's right. why they pushed him down. But did yeah. she sometimes overestimate uh, her husband? What was her role? Well, they were very fond of each other. Um, and right from the get-go, I guess, he fell in love with her very quickly. And they were very fond of each other. And she was his number one cheerleader. There's no question about it. Um, I'm sure she did overestimate him, as love makes people do. Uh, she made him bigger than he was and thought that, you know, if you put her husband in any situation, he'd solve the problem there. But... Um, I don't see that as a flaw in any way. I, you know, it was just, she loved him. And when she died, he was heartbroken. There's, there are some, you know, there's evidence that he had, and, and this has come up with other historians that he had relationships with other women and, and maybe even before Sarah was gone. I don't find any of that 
particularly persuasive. Mm. I don't think he was blind. I think that when he, you know, he's a man who, could, if he saw an attractive woman, he may have felt things, you know, or been interested or whatever, but he was very loyal and very devoted to Sarah and um, was heartbroken when she died. I want to get into the meat of the book. I guess all of it is meat, frankly, but uh, sorry, the, more into the war years and actually post-war as well. Uh, but he was a lawyer uh, and just very briefly, what aspects of his early legal career should we know about? I know his post uh, legal, I was surprised to find that he had been uh, one of the defense lawyers for two of the Haymarket bombers here in Chicago. And that was later in his- uh, He's like life. Forrest Gump. I call him Forrest Butler sometimes. Every yes. time you think, oh my God, there he is again. Now he's involved <laughs> with the Haymarket bombers. He's everywhere. So what was his legal career like prior to the war? Prior to the war, he made a lot of, um, he did a lot of work for the Lowell Mill Girls. So he was very involved in the women workers' rights and um, representing them in cases for very little money to help them, you know, um, argue with their bosses and so on. And I found that really fascinating to think that he started there. And I think that comes out of his his youth in poverty and his mother being a boarding housekeeper and so on. And he was also involved in the um, the 10 hour workday movement. Um, and then of course he was involved in democratic politics too, but his his legal career was largely with, you know, underdogs and the poorer sort, people who might show up in police court sometimes um, and so on. Well, I was just about to get to his autobiography, but I see Bjorn, do you have something that you want to shoehorn in? Sure, I have something to talk about. Uh, but more importantly, we have people that want to talk, uh, that want to ask questions of Elizabeth. But you both know this, and I know this, but maybe the people on Facebook don't know it. The, the Haymarket people that uh, Ben Butler represented were not bombers. The bomber got away. Uh, these people were accused of being labor leaders and exercising their First Amendment rights. <laughs> but Good point. that's for a, that's for the story of uh, of Haymarket. No, I want to I want to introduce a uh, uh, a couple of people who are watching today on our Facebook account. We do have first of all we have Joe Normandy from Lowell, Massachusetts, and uh, Joe has a lot to talk about today. But also greetings go out to Bob Willard out in California, and we're we're going to see Bob when it comes around to the Lincoln Forum in a few months. Okay. And uh, Dave Wiegers is here uh, from, from Gurley, Gurney, Illinois. Uh, I think the first question I want is, I want to, I want to throw out a, a comment and a question that Joe in Lowell wants to, wants to say. Um, uh, the first comment is, I don't know whether you want to respond, but the comment is from Joe is, my favorite quote from Butler, which reflects his distrust of the papers, was when his friend Major Castles was in hot water Butler wrote back one line, never mind the newspapers, just do your duty. Great quote. And then, uh, but then Joe has this question, as a Lowell native, do you think Ben Butler got his financial jump start from the death of his brother, Colonel Andrew Butler? No, and he wasn't a Lowell native. Is, is This is Joe is saying he's a Lowell native, Joe himself, because Butler was not a Lowell yeah. native. Butler was a native of New Hampshire right. and moved to Lowell when he was, a, you know, in his, in his tween years, I guess, or 12 or 13. Anyway, um, no, I, I think he got his financial start much earlier. I think he was already doing well as a lawyer. And I think the book talks about that um, even before the Civil War. Um, so I think that he, he was making his way well without it. And in fact, his brother was sort of a, a ne'er do well. <laughs> you know, his brother was a problem for him. And um, if Sarah, you know, was her husband's cheerleader, she was not nearly as fond of his brother, who seemed to be causing her husband a lot of trouble, especially in New Orleans. All right, good. Thank you. Thank you, Joe, for, the, for that comment and that question. And uh, then we have one question from uh, Ricky Newport. And I like this question. I've been wanting to ask this one. Uh, 
How would you characterize the relationship between Butler and his son-in-law, Adelbert Ames? Oh. And don't you think a new biography of Ames is needed? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I, this was fascinating to me. And I really, it was, of course, the more, you know, as I studied all of Butler's life, I didn't just do the war years, but went, you know, all the way through his life. Mm -hmm. His relationship with Adelbert was was very strong and very. Um, they shared a lot of views at, on what Reconstruction should look like. That put them far out on the radical wing of the Republican Party. Um, and uh, no, they. I thought their relationship was really strong and great. And certainly, they were very happy, both he and Sarah, that this was the man that that Blanche had. Um, decided to marry. Mm -hmm. And I think there, the son, that Adelbert was very supportive of his of his father-in-law too. If there you know. was, if there is a biography of Ames other than the one written by what, his daughter? I don't, I don't know of it. I don't know. No, he definitely deserves one. And now in our cultural climate today would be a great time to go back to this wonderful reconstruction governor who struggled so hard to hold the line for the radical Republicans in Mm -hmm. you know, in the South and, and wasn't able to and was eventually, you know, they were impeaching him and they were threatening his life that, you know, the white Democrats that came back into mm -hmm. power. So, um, yeah, I'd love to know more about Adelbert. That's everything that our customers have for the moment. So I may come back at the end of our, of our, uh, of our hour, but I know Dan has a lot to talk about. So I am going to duck out and let Dan take over the conversation again. Okay. Well, uh, first of all, uh, I guess, you know what, I think I'm going to wait with this for one second. I want to go back to his autobiography. Uh, autobiography and Personal Reminiscences, known by most as Butler's book. Do you have a copy there? Big, thick Ew, book. It's a monster. It's a great book. Okay. <laughs> I have several copies, actually. Oh, we could use one here. Uh, could you? I'll send you one. I really do have several autobiography copies. That and uh, a good, it was a good source for you. Uh, and of course, we read memoirs of historical figures to understand what they wish us to know about them and their era. Uh, now, in a footnote, you reflect uh, on the book's errors as to historical record. So how useful is that book uh, and to, to both to you and to readers today? It's very useful for understanding him and there's a tremendous amount of information there, but it's not something you would ever use as your only source. For one thing, um, it would seem from the way the book is constructed, like the Civil War lasted for 40 years, you know, and the early part of his life was five minutes and the latter part of his life was 10 minutes. You know, it's, it's so focused on the Civil War years, even though it claims to be an autobiography. So, um, and, and clearly he wanted to correct some uh, things that had been said about him or reorient people's thinking on things. So it's, you know, it's an autobiography. It's his take on his life. And, uh, but it's very useful if, if only for understanding his mentality. You get to mm -hmm. know Butler a lot and how he felt about things by reading the autobiography. That doesn't mean he's right all the time with the details, you know, so no. you have to read a lot of other stuff, but it's, it's a oh. wonderful, fascinating read and, and quite well written most of the time. There's a lot of republished stuff in there. But. Mm -hmm. And of course he didn't, uh persuade historians afterward, it seems, until your book comes out, which we get a <laughs> new and fresh uh, interest in him. Now listen, today is, there are really two consequential events of uh, May 24th in 1861. One of them, and we should, we've got to mention, today is the day that Elmer Ellsworth was murdered at the Marshall Hotel uh, trying to take down a secesh flag. And of course he was consequential to the nation. They all really mourned him. Uh, he was well known from his Zouave drill team. I also happen to have right now, and just wanna show it because this came from Marshall that day. One of the soldiers picked up this menu from the Marshall house uh, with Jackson's name on it and what you could have gotten if Ellsworth didn't come in that day and mess up the menu, uh, but 
Uh, one of the one of the uh, soldiers wrote about picking this up at that time. So this was the death day of Elmer Ellsworth. But also, as you've been pointing out today as well on social media, Elizabeth, is that um, he became commander of Fort Monroe. And he did something on his own. He refused to give back three escaped slaves to their owner, declaring them to be contraband of war. So what ensued? How, how did he shape the future of the Civil War and what were the ramifications of what he did right then and how was he supported, by the way, by the administration? I think it's Im probably impossible to overstate how important this decision was. Um, and he did make it on his own. He asked for direction. He didn't get any direction. So he made the decision. He talked to these former enslaved, these enslaved people who had run away. Uh, and over the course of, you know, about 24 hours, he thought, well, Virginia has declared itself independent. That means that I do not have to honor the Fugitive Slave Act when it comes to these enslaved people. I'm going to put it that way, and I'm going to call them contraband of war. And he continued to ask for guidance. And basically, the administration um, said nothing except sort of go ahead and, you know, or they allowed him to continue. Uh, and within days, Fort Monroe was swarmed with for you know, hundreds of enslaved people who were now seeking protection. And that in itself put a lot of pressure on Congress, put pressure on Lincoln to begin making some decisions about this all important question that this war was about. Those decisions hadn't been made yet, uh, but this is an, a, an extremely important moment in beginning the process towards emancipation. Yeah, he's not been giving, I think, the due on that very much. Uh, I think this book uh, helps that along. Uh, it's interesting where he began on the issue of blacks and slavery. Yeah. And uh, maybe even uh, showing racist or perceived Absolutely. racist uh, support. Uh, to the point at the end of his death, though, uh, to the end of his life, where Frederick Douglass admired him where Blacks across the nation mourned him. So seemingly, he had, just like Lincoln, a capacity for growth and development. And also for having Blacks serve in the military. He, was, he got to be on board even before Grant and Stanton, and certainly it was before Lincoln wanting to have Blacks serve in the military. So, what tell us about this capacity for growth in this area of uh, blacks and slavery, please? Well, he, you know, he grew up in New England, where he rarely had seen a black person, if ever, and he was focused on factory labor uh, and saw that as the true crisis of labor in the United States because that was what he knew most about. Um, and he just didn't really have the language or cultural experience to understand the implications of slavery and the meaning of race in connection with slavery. But as he met these, as he went into the war, served at Fort Monroe, met these runaway slaves, went to New Orleans, began to work with black soldiers, um, he was dramatically transformed. The two things, you know, he, he, his experience with black soldiers was, as for Joseph Holt, that was also true. His experience of black soldiers was absolutely transformative uh, in terms of his attitudes about race and um, certainly about slavery in, in the nation. And he never looked back. He just never looked back. He never decided, well, okay, that was interesting. Now I'll do some other thing. Right to the end of his life, 
He continued, he had promised his black soldiers he would stand by them forever and continue to open whatever doors he could. And they remembered that promise as veterans and in the post-war period. And he stuck to it as best he could, despite also beginning, you know, focusing on women's rights and the rights of the poor and the rights of labor, um, white labor and farmers and so on. Yes, I was uh, very interested in how much labor was involved in his life, how he supported labor and in what way, uh, yeah. even though he was also for profit. Right. He but he, he didn't believe that, lab that, that, say, capitalists and la capital and labor had to necessarily be at odds with each other. Maybe he's wrong about that, but he didn't believe it. He believed that, you know, there could be a healthy shared commitment and relationship uh, and that's what he wanted to work towards. What was his uh, political evolution? Again, he, yeah. he changed parties, you know, like he did supper uh, dress. Uh, he uh, was a Democrat in, uh, in the beginning, uh, in, a, in Lowell, for instance, where there were many Whigs as well. And uh, he went into the Republican Party to an extent Afterward, we let's maybe wait for that afterwards if we have a little bit of time to get into uh, post-war politics of his, but he changed parties a number of times. Was that usual, first of all, for men of the era or was he uh, an outlier? I think he was an outlier. Um, I think it was not usual. I think it isn't usually, you know, even today, there's a lot, although we don't see parties in quite the same way, but I think there was tremendous uh, emphasis put on party loyalty and um, certainly in his, in, in his life and in, after he died, that was a source of, you know, a lot of mockery again for him, a lot of maligning by people who said, oh, he was so fickle. You know, he just went from one thing to the next. But what he said, and what I really came to believe is that, no, I have a set of principles I have some goals that I have always had and the parties keep moving around me. And that's really true. And We've I will today. go with the party. Yeah, that, that I will, I don't care about the party for the party's sake. I care about the party for the policy's sake. And if mm -hmm. they don't support the policies, I have no problem moving in another direction. And that that is, so instead of seeing him as fickle, we can see the parties as fickle and him mm -hmm. as faithful to his principles. Yeah. I mean, and ultimately he was sort of party less, you know, he sort of felt like mm -hmm. both the Democrats and the Republicans had betrayed, you know, uh, the people that he cared most about and showed no interest in doing anything except for the, the rich and powerful. And uh, yeah, you know, why frankly, later, why <laughs> later he was, uh, the anti-monopoly party, the Greenback, right, Greenback party, party. yeah, yeah. And, you and know, then finally own, forget it, you know, yeah, run, forget yeah. It. <laughs> I mean, yeah, run myself. Yeah. Uh, what was he going into the war? What were his views on sectionalism? I mean, he was not opposed to the Southern views uh, to some extent. And certainly at the 1860 Democratic Convention in Baltimore, he supported Jefferson Davis. Right, so right. What was his view coming in? His view was pro-union. And, and also at that point, probably more, you know, he was much younger and really just getting his foothold in politics and perhaps more loyal to the Democratic Party. He maybe felt that this new Republican Party really would destroy the country, that that would lead to an, an erup a rupture. Uh, and so he was most interested in finding a way to elect a Democrat so as not to elect a Republican. And Davis, um, you know, of course, he's been made fun of for this too and called a doe face and all of that stuff. But his view, it's a, it's a complicated story and I try to go through it as well as I can in, in the area ch section of the book where I talk about it. But, you know, he sort of settled on Jefferson Davis as the Democrat most likely to be able to beat Lincoln or whoever the Republicans nominated. Uh, and uh, yeah, well, obviously. Yeah, he moved <laughs> more... <laughs> but, and well, then the whole thing, his... you know, everything blows up. Well, what was his relationship with Lincoln? Uh, 
we're here at the Abraham Lincoln Bookshop, so we have to ask that. Yeah. Uh, what was the relationship and what was Lincoln's general view of Butler? And did Lincoln help him understand the Republican side, maybe because it was union more than anything? Yeah, I think his relationship with Lincoln was a delicate one. I, I mean, it was, it, you know, these are, Butler had a huge ego. I think, you know, if you'd asked him in 1860, if someday he wanted to be president, he might have said, yes, if I can, you know, because I would like to have the power to make the kinds of changes in society that I think the president can make, although he sort of gave up on an idea too. But, um, but Lincoln knew that he needed Butler because of Butler's connections and because of his Democratic Party affiliation and and because of his enormous popularity with people who, who loved him, you know. But he also knew that Butler wasn't the most efficient and the most effective commander in the field. He certainly was one of the best administrators, military administrators. Um, We'll but it was that. it was yes. a difficult, complicated relationship that sort of goes through various phases, um, I think. Was there any friction because Butler opposed colonization when Lincoln was still flirting with it? Yeah, I, I don't know where they, you know, if they had that kind of conversation. Um, there's a bunch of Sam and P. Chase. Uh, we just had uh, Walter Starr's book on Sam mm -hmm. and P. Chase, and he was here a few weeks ago. And there's a lot of correspondence that you quote in the book between Butler and Chase. What was their relationship? I think that Chase was a strong supporter of, of Butler for a, quite a long time and, and always kind of pushing him towards um, advancing his views on race and slavery and emancipation and black rights, you know, until um, after the war in the Milligan case where Chase kind of as you know, when he's on the Supreme Court, right? And he's, and the decision comes down in the Milligan case. <laughs> yeah, Butler, no, you're, you're not winning this one. But I think mm -hmm. they had a good relationship and, and Chase was kind of always nudging him forward. Now he was, Butler, a political general, let's face it. Yeah. Uh, what did that application mean to the general public and to the regular army men at that time? Because Butler certainly felt as you say, the sting of prejudice uh, from the regular army men. And of course, he probably felt the sting, Butler himself felt that sting because he didn't get an appointment to West Point, which he wanted to have at one point. So what was being a political general to the outsiders and to Butler himself? Well, I think that he had both, um, pride and I won't say shame. I think he he did he had really wanted to go to West Point. But when he didn't get the commission, you know, when he couldn't go to West Point and he went to Waterville instead, he came to peace with that as sort of saying, well, you know, we're just reg we're just the ordinary folks, you know, and we are the people from our communities who fight because we want to, you know, fight and we train because we want to train and we represent our communities. Uh, we're not just professional, you know, soldiers who do it because we have to do it. Um, so it was always sort of a little of both, like the, the, he, I think he would have been very happy to have been able to go to West Point, but I think he also um, found a way to feel quite comfortable being a political general and to use that to his advantage. You know, Did he feel that his strength was at, as an administrator more than as a field general? Did he I understand think that, that he I, I'm, I'm th I think he probably thought he was a better field general than a lot of other people thought he was because mm -hmm. that's what kind of guy he was. Okay. But he certainly knew he was a good administrator and everybody else knew that too. And, and that was one of the reasons it was hard to spare him because he was so uh, good. And I will say, you know, I'm not a military historian, so this is not my strong suit, but I, I found the arguments that in, in the scholarship that suggested, in fact, he really wasn't so bad. You know, he wasn't so much worse than other 
West Pointers who were blundering hither and yon. And, um, and he happened to be like Forrest Gump, you know, always in these big moments where he got a lot of attention for the blunders that he was linked to, but they weren't particularly in most cases worse. And he had some good successes like in North Carolina. And again, in a footnote, you quote uh, David Work. Uh, it was an interesting quote. Uh, that he, work said that Lincoln, quote, did not always employ political generals effectively. You think that uh, he was used ineffectively, Butler? Uh, that's a difficult question to answer. I, I, he certainly would say he was used not as effectively as he could have been used. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think that he, he was in some very good places. Uh, no, I would say he was used quite effectively overall. Okay. I mean, that his war record in terms of the things he accomplished, what he did in New Orleans, what he did with the contraband, what he did with the army of the James, I don't know. I mean, Dutch Gap, uh, you know, yeah. <laughs> what can we say? And I mean, Fort there was Fisher, some, another one. Yeah, Fort Fisher. Um, you know, but Fort Fisher was captured at great cost to yep. the art, right? Yep. You know, and he didn't want to do that. So, yeah, that's a difficult question to, to answer. Um, the Now, as Bjorn said to me going into this, that at least, but Grant never did fire him, even when he didn't do what Grant had hoped for. How, now that we're on Grant for a moment, how did Grant... Uh, view Butler in his memoirs. What was was there? What was their relationship like? Yeah, in his memoirs, Grant is the one who you know famously used that phrase about. Well, he had previously used the phrase he was bottled up, right? And so he's yes. bottled up Butler, um, yeah. at in in Virginia, at Bermuda Hundred. Um, I think Grant uh, kind of apologized in his memoirs uh, in it as best he could and said he really felt that he had, I think what he meant, I, I'm paraphrasing here, but that he had s somehow stuck Butler with this epithet uh, that lasted and failed to really um, give him the praise he was due for having done the very best he could under so many difficult circumstances and that he wasn't the greatest you know, subordinate in a lot of ways, but he had been faithful. And um, I, I think, you know, Grant was somewhat remorseful about the way he had handled the Butler story. No, but they had a tense relationship too, you know, uh, in certainly when Butler was thinking he was, you know, maybe gonna move up in the political world and it looked like Grant was gonna be, you know, and he resented Grant's, you know, not having been more full of praise for him. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, of course, you devote a large chapter to New Orleans. That's what many of us know a great deal about Butler right. from. Um, right. Was he chosen because of his administrative skills? I think so. And, and, and he, I mean, he have, did very well in Baltimore early he, on. Yes, and he had done well at Fort Monroe. I think that... Um, Yes, I think that and, and there are also, you know, there are theories that maybe he was sent there to get him far away from Washington because, mm -hmm. you know, maybe he'd be a political threat because he was so well known and he was so um, assertive uh, and so on. But I think if we go back to that, I talk about the Harper's Fair, Harper's Fair, the Harper's Weekly magazine of June of 1861, where Butler is on the cover. And the whole story is basically saying, this is the man who's going to save the union, <laughs> you know, which is something we forget that people believed, you know. And I think some of that still, you know, that um, positive feeling about him still lingered by 1862. They also thought that of Shields and of Pope and even McClellan. So, right. you know. Right. It took a while to find that. Of course, he had many problems in New Orleans. Uh, it was a challenge. Uh, uh, hunger, all the, oh yeah, hunger of the population, supplying his troops, yellow fever. We haven't even gotten into the yellow fever and how that uh, affected him. 
uh, insults from Southern women. We certainly know about that. Resulted in General Order Number 28. Uh, did he, though, generally rule by fear? His policy being fire set to fire, as you put in the book. He had hangings, loyalty oaths, rewards for capture of guerrillas, destruction of homes, oaths of allegiance for foreigners. What was it like? I wouldn't say he ruled by fear. I think that he ruled with a very strong hand. Um, and um, I think when he, and, and of course that's where the epithet, the beast, you know, comes yeah. from, that he was such a beast to these poor, poor New Orleans who, you know, poor them. And, and that is really, to me, a way of looking at him through a lost cause lens mm -hmm. and failing to recognize what he was dealing with in New Orleans, you know, so far from the center of power, this extremely important commercial city, the beginnings of reconstruction, right? I mean, it's gonna happen, it's gonna start here. What he had to deal with and the rebelliousness of this population, you know, that needed, and then all of this runaway enslaved people too, no. <laughs> dealing with that. I mean, the problems there and the yellow, I mean, there was a lot for him to contend with, that he and he had to make decisions on his own, and I think he, you know, he ruled with a very strong hand. It's a wonderful chapter, and I think very illuminating. And people should read that to get a better understanding uh, of that man. Uh, of course, he was replaced by Nathaniel Banks, and he went back to uh, Lowell. James Parton, the historian of the day, wrote a very supportive book. <laughs> to put him. it to put it gently, extremely hagiographical. And did that, uh, how did that, how did that go down with the reading public? Did they take that in and perhaps that helped him later in his political career? Oh, that's a good question. I don't really know how well the book was received in that moment. I, I suspect that Butler both liked, Butler himself both liked it and was also a little embarrassed. I mean, he had specifically said to Parton, don't write a book about me that is, you know, just purely um, glowing. Uh, and Parton went ahead and did it anyway, um, and, which Butler probably both loved and didn't love. You know, we're, we've gone into our time almost here, oh, my but goodness. we're not going to, it goes fast, but we're not going to end. I have, I have a number of questions I really want to go in and out of. So give me kind of a pithy answer if you can. And as I mentioned earlier, let the people buy and read this book. That's, you know, we're, really, we're not going to spoon feed them here. We're just showing them all the interesting facets of this interesting man and of your book that's so well written. Uh, new technology. He was interested in that, uh, reconnaissance balloons, vaccinations, elevated like railroads. Needed. Exactly. So he was he always interested in technology. If he was I think so. Well, when he was at Waterville College, he wanted to be a scientist. That's what mm -hmm. he wanted to do. He wanted to be a chemist or some kind of scientist, you know, and he attributed that in many ways to his grandmother and his mother who had made him go out and look at the stars, you know, and understand the sky. Um, so yeah, he was always interested in that kind of stuff. I wonder if he and Lincoln ever shared a moment about technology. <laughs> yeah. Um, he was put just before the 1864 election, he was sent to New York so there wouldn't be any rioting or disruptions of the election. How did New Yorkers take him? They loved it that he was there because he was there. They knew him from New Orleans. At least I won't say they, meaning all of New York, but people that wanted New York to be kept peaceful during that election were delighted that Butler was the one who was sent to make sure that happened. Um, I, I want to ask you a specific question here because of your background and studies. Um, Southern women and Southerners anywhere were always afraid of Blacks free, freeing themselves, insurrections, reprisals. Were there any real reprisals from the Black population? They were, weren't they more interested in getting the hell out? Reprisals against, against Southern, white Southerners? White Southerners. Uh, uh, no, 
yeah, simple I, answer I is that, you know, all these fears and then in the post-war period, the sort of uh, terrifying black rapist image, it's all concocted. And as Ida B. Wells so beautifully pointed out, it's really a flipping of the reality of white violence against blacks. Um, it's a projection <laughs> from right, right. white violence against right. blacks, not the least white men's violence against black women. Uh, and you it's sort of like the mole lives in the dark, right? Yep. And can only see the dark. Uh, and projection is a great phrase yeah. for this. I think I'll, yeah. I'll take that up as a son of a psychoanalyst. Projection yeah. is exactly what that was. Yeah. Um, so much, Department of Virginia, North Carolina, we don't have time to get into that right now. But I do want to, years ago, I had a uh, telegram from Lincoln to Judson Kilpatrick to come to the White House to talk to the executive mansion, excuse me, to talk to him about uh, the his proposed raid into Richmond. Butler had numbers of proposed proposed raids. He's always into planning Richmond. something. <laughs> always yeah. planning something. Uh, and of course, this one didn't work out. Dahlgren, uh, the admiral's son, was killed trying to get out. Part of the reason the whole thing blew up is that Kilpatrick, even though it was allegedly his raid, didn't go in and support Dahlgren. He stopped before he went into Richmond. Um, but what was Butler's uh, um, role in at least the Dahlgren Kilpatrick raid? Well, it was something that he, you know, plotted basically, if I'm not mistaken now, this is with the uh, under the advice of Elizabeth Van Lu, the the Richmond spy who suggested, you know, maybe you could come in here and um, turn the tide here in Richmond. Um, but it didn't go the way that he had hoped. It was one of his many plots, let's put yeah. it that way, where he was not only trying to achieve you know, the goal of capturing Richmond or conquering the Confederacy, but, you know, he was always kind of seeking an opportunity for military glory for himself. Well, what was Butler's general um, difficulties that he had with subordinates and who actually did support him? Uh, certainly yeah. Baldy Smith, Quincy Gilmore, he couldn't wait to get rid of them. Couldn't uh, wait to get and rid he of happened them. to do a little bit better after they were gone militarily, strangely yeah. enough. But what was his general relationship with his subordinates? I think he had subordinates who couldn't stand him and subordinates who adored him. And that was sort of a, a truism about his whole life. He, he I'm sure, um, rubbed some people the wrong way. Uh, he was sure of himself, perhaps in certain areas more than he should have been, which would have annoyed people who maybe had better training in certain areas than he did. Um, but someone like um, George Shepley, who served with him and then served with him in, in Louisiana and so on, he had people who were deeply, deeply loyal to him. And certainly, again, many of the leaders of the Black regiments, you know, felt very loyal. Too. Well, it's interesting that we talked about it before. For a man who didn't start out wishing to have black soldiery, he must have. What did, what do you? What did he say after New Market Heights? The maybe the greatest success of uh, the colored troops during the war. Fourteen medals of honor were awarded there, and one of those medals of honor, the first one, Christian Fleetwood, was one of his pallbearers. You know, at his funeral. Yeah. So Butler must have felt very proud of that uh, and that growth in himself, maybe to have helped that along. Yeah, I'm sure he did. And I think he also felt deeply humbled. There's a wonderful quote in the book of him riding past the bodies of his soldiers, the, the, the fallen uh, black soldiers and looking at their faces and looking at them and what they gave when they had, as he believed, so little potentially to gain from their sacrifice in this terrible war, and yet they had sacrificed everything. And, and I, that's when it's after New Market Heights that he really makes this pledge, I will never leave you. you know, <laughs> I will do what I can to advance your cause as citizens. And later in his life, he says something like, I'd rather have a 
you know, a, a black man standing by my side than a white man, you know, aiming a, aiming a gun in my mm -hmm. face. Uh, and I will stand by him too. I, I think that that really transformed him. One of the or many the purpose great... sort of sealed the deal for him, you know. One of the many great quotes that you just gave that are in this book, there's so many. And I urge you, if you get this book and read it, get into the footnotes. There's a lot there that will also, um, it'll, it'll strike your imagination quite a bit and change you a bit, uh, getting into his verbiage if you're not gonna read the Butler, uh, Butler book. Uh, again, very quick, because we really are past our time here. He was a congressman during uh, the Reconstruction from 65 to 74. Uh, how would you evaluate him? Did he fit into the construct Reconstruction Congress? Uh, how would you evaluate him very briefly as congressman? He fit in when the Republic, when the radicals were in charge. Uh, and as the Congress became, um, you know, at, with, with Reconstruction and the return of the former Confederate States, the, the, the weight of the, uh, or the politics changed in Congress and he didn't fit in towards the end. And I think he, you know, after he was there five terms with a brief, you know, hiatus. And I think he realized I just have no place here anymore because the politics have changed. It's all about white reconciliation and I'm still talking about advancing black rights. Mm -hmm. you know? So how about as governor of Massachusetts? Uh, what sort of governor did he make? Uh, his administrative skills must have uh, helped him in that. Uh, and he, of course, also had a reformer's mentality, but right. what was he like as a governor? Well, it was such a short experience, you yes, know, it was. one year and uh, he didn't get to do much, but he did get to name the first black judge. Uh, and he uh, did what he could to clean up the almshouse, the Tewksbury almshouse and straighten that out. And uh, uh, that was he, an awful story. I didn't. Oh know my God. Oh. It's grotesque Ouch. really. And yeah. I, there was this pamphlet, it goes on and on. I mean, you only get a taste of how grotesque it was. Um, wow. And, and he named Clara Barton um, to a yes. position in a women's uh, prison, if I'm not mistaken. Anyway, he was very busy. Um, he, he ticked off um, people by being so shameless about going to Harvard for the commencement. <laughs> ah, he is, it's, a, it's a wonderful year to sort of get a feel for all the things that matter to him. And of course, throughout all this, there were people asking him to run for president. Yep. He certainly wanted to run for president. As we Good. spoke much earlier, the anti-monopoly party wanted him, the Greenback Party. Some of the Democrats wanted him. Black uh, Americans, blame, many of them wanted him to run for president. You know, and, but it, it came to be uh, James Blaine versus Grover Cleveland. Uh, and uh, what did he do then? We know he didn't, he ran, he ran. Uh, but only got a very infinitesimal amount of votes, not enough to have a bookshop named after him. There's no <laughs> Benjamin Frank Butler uh, bookshop. But uh, so how did he feel about losing that? Did he? equanimity and gone on? I think he was, you know, bitter for a little while, but he was also much older by then, getting tired. Um, and and I think his overall feeling was we that he had, he hoped, sadly it wasn't really true, but he hoped he had laid the foundation for a people's party that would mm -hmm. not be the Democratic Party or the Republican Party, but would be a party of the people, you know, labor, and women and, um, and, and the underprivileged. And well, that's what he that thought would, would come a, together for him that would, in that presidential run. Yeah. yeah, and he thought that he had laid the foundation. You know, I think Adelbert, his son-in-law said something like, um, he, your father, when he wrote to Blanche, he said, your father may not feel too sanguine about his election chances, but he feels sanguine about having created the foundation for this people's party, which um, I think he sort of lost faith in that towards the end of his life, the possibility mm -hmm. of that, but I think he, you know, and then he went on, he was always, he always had something to do. Even if it was just playing billiards and smoking cigars and playing with his grandchildren, you know, he kept busy. Not a bad thing. No. Uh, so look, Elizabeth, really a wonderful book. Congratulations on this. It, it, kept me interested in a man I didn't expect to have interest in. And I learned a great deal of him and respect him more. Uh, so Benjamin Franklin Butler, a noisy, fearless life, and that it is 
and this is noisy inside here. It's really wonderful. And if you get, you will get a book plate uh, as well. So don't forget to get one of these. It should, it belongs on your bookshelf to give a better view of a general that you didn't expect to have a better view from. Elizabeth, thank you so much for thank you. being with us in a house divided and uh, look forward to your next. Yeah. <laughs> okay.